Hello and welcome to today's webinar titled, Design a Smaller, Lighter, and Lower Cost Switch Mode Power Supply, brought to you by Keysight Technologies. This webinar is part of the Keysight Engineering Education Series. I'm Carmina, and let me introduce today's speaker. Dr. Colin Warwick is a product manager for Power Electronics, where his focus is on design and analysis tools for engineers building high DIDT switch mode power supplies. Before joining Keysight, Colin was with Royal Signals and Radar Establishment in Malvern, England, Bell Labs in Holmden, New Jersey, and the MathWorks in Natick, Massachusetts. He completed his bachelor, master's, and doctorate degrees in physics at the University of Oxford, England. He has published over 50 technical articles and holds 13 patents. Colin, the floor is yours. Thank you for that introduction. Very kind. So what's going on with switch mode power supplies that's new? Well, consumers are demanding lower costs, smaller size, and lighter weight. And these demands are in turn driving the industry to higher switching speed. We call this era the high DIDT era in the industry terminology. It turns out that cost, size, and weight are determined mainly by three components, the heat sink, the inductor, and the capacitor. For reasons I'll explain, if you switch faster, you can use smaller, lighter, cheaper versions of these components. But here's the challenge. Traditional kind of cut and try design methodologies don't work in the high DIDT era because of the large voltage spikes, uh, V spike equals L parasitic times DIDT, from the layout parasitics. So we need to have a field solver to extract those layout parasitics into an EM-based model, and that's where we come in. But before we get into layout parasitics, let me first try to convince you that switching faster will enable you to make a smaller heatsink, a smaller inductor, and a smaller capacitor. To illustrate, let's look at the simplest possible buck converter. The switching produces a rectangular wave of duty cycle D and frequency F. For the inductor and capacitor to filter out the non-DC components, the knee frequency must be lower than the switch frequency. A low switching frequency requires high values for the L and C, and this implies high weight and cost. On the other hand, a high switching frequency lets us use lower L and C values, have a higher knee frequency, and have lower size, weight, and cost. Now, what about the heat sink? Here's the rub. Actually, a higher switching frequency could lead to a higher switching loss and the need for a bigger heat sink, which is exactly the opposite of what we want. So if you want the heat sink to be the same size, or preferably even smaller, we have to also increase the edge speed. On the left graph, the low frequency and slow edges have a, a reasonable low switching loss, in this case, 3.5%, which is the power dissipated in the transistors during the crossover region, expressed as a fraction of the input power. Going to a higher frequency with the same slow edge speed could cause the switching loss to increase unacceptably, in this case, to 15.3%, way unacceptable. The transistors aren't even turning off properly. To maintain the same switching loss, or even reduce it, you have to increase the DIDT edge speed commensurate with this higher switching frequency. In fact, if you want to reduce the switching loss, you have to improve the edge speed even more dramatically than improving the switching frequency. With high DIDT, you can have the heat sink and the L and the C smaller, but now you have to deal with another effect, which is the voltage spikes that come from layout parasitic inductance. That equation, the inductor equation, V equals L DIDT. So we'd like a high switching uh, speed in the switch loop, showed here in this pre-layout schematic. At first blush, you might think the only thing you need is a fast transistor, and you can certainly get those these days. We'll talk about uh, some options later on. But there's more to the high DIDT in a fast transistor, as you'll see in this next slide. This is the same circuit in a post-layout view. The physical PCB tracers have a finite impedance, and in particular the inductive component gives rise to a troublesome spike voltage that can overstress, overstress the transistor or even destroy it totally. Let's get out the whiteboard and do some simple algebra to figure out when this becomes a problem. We start with the inductor equation and assume a simple linear ramp from 1 to the on current, ion, in a rise time tau. 
You can stop here if you like. If you know your DIDT is, say, half an amp per nanosecond and the switch loop is, say, 10 millimeters, you can estimate its inductance at 10 nanohenries, and so the spike voltage is going to be on the order of 5 volts. That can be a big problem. But let's go further. Let's divide both sides by V off, the off voltage across the uh, switch transistor. Now let's ask the question, what inductance, let's call it um, L10%, what inductor will give you an overstress of, say, 10% voltage over the V-off voltage? Just rearrange, and we get this expression. Plug in some numbers, let's say maybe a laptop power brick, for example, and the answer is uh, not very much inductance can cause big problems. A few millimeters of wire will give you a 10% overstress with the numbers I've picked here, which is uh, 10 nanoseconds rise time, a V-off of 20 volts, an I-off of... Uh, Four amps. Uh, four, five nanohenries is, is nothing. You know, just a few millimeters of wire can give you five nanohenries, and already you're up to 10% overstress. Very easy to run to this problem. Now, when I show that previous slide, people ask me, Colin, why do you focus on the inductance, not the capacitance, the um, this parasitic capacitance? And of course, there is. So let's run the numbers on capacitance, and I think you'll agree that the inductance is often the, the bigger problem. So the equivalent for capacitance is I equals C. Uh, dv dt, so the same deal, we'll do a v off and a rise time. Divide this time both sides by i on. What capacitance will give me a, vol uh, a current spike this time, 10% uh, larger than uh, over, over current compared to i on? So you rearrange and uh, the capacitance to give you this 10% over current is given by this equation. Plug in some numbers, and it turns out that until you're in the medium voltage uh, range, say 2 kilovolt uh, range, and maybe an, uh, an amp, then then you'll start to see uh, problematic capacitance, say half a picofarad, um, a, a one milli, uh, square millimeter power over ground is about half a puff. So you can run into the problems, but it tends to uh, occur at the higher voltage, uh, uh, medium voltage circuitries like uh, kilovolt and above. So generally, for most uh, applications, the inductance is the bigger problem. Another way of looking at uh, the same thing from a different perspective, this, uh, this way of looking at it actually comes from Professor Lamont at University of uh, Alabama. He gave us this slide to show. And it's the fact that when you take a, a very short rise time pulse, it has uh, harmonics going up into the uh, radio frequencies. In fact, a rule of thumb is you take the uh, uh, rise time and divide it into uh, a number typically between 0.3 and 0.5. It depends on the shape of the uh, edge and so on. I've chosen an example here, uh, 0.48. For a particular shape, you divide uh, the rise time into 0.48 and you get a knee frequency. This tells you how many harmonics you have to worry about above the switching frequency fundamental. You have harmonics. And for 10 nanosecond edges, the uh, you're dealing with uh, HF and VHF frequencies. There's no way around it. So you're compelled to really use uh, um, RF microwave techniques because of the um, harmonics in the uh, switching uh, waveform. Okay, let's look at the impact this has on the workflow, the design flow, um, the design approach you might use. In the traditional kind of low speed, low DI uh, era, the design approach is what I call pre layout, spice, and then uh, cut and try. You do a pre-layout schematic in some kind of spice tool, get the best case performance. Maybe you'll see some spiking from the package inductance. But you can't see any layout parasitics, uh, obviously, because it's the pre-layout tool. It doesn't take um, the layout into account. Uh, Draft person will do the artwork. You build the first prototype. You can probe several points. You may find a bit of excess ringing from the board that you weren't, weren't expecting on the oscilloscope. Um, but you can flip things over, do some white wiring, in this particular case, attempt to lower the trace impedance by building up the critical trace with some hand soldering, not really effective. Uh, but you get close, you can spin the design a few times. Uh, customers tell us this is typical. Um, two to six spins, a uh, few K per spin, maybe th several weeks per spin, a schedule slip. Kind of expensive in time and money, um, but after some uh, wailing and wringing of hands and gnashing of teeth and burning of midnight oil, you might beat down the parasitics and finally approach the best case that you saw in the pre-layout uh, simulation and you're good to go. 
So pre-layout pre spice cut and try is kind of painful in the low I, low over the IDT area, but it kind of works. But if you apply that old method to, uh, at the high speed area, you can get into real trouble. You do some kind of pre-layout spice, get the best case, uh, but the first prototype you build comes back. You do a smoke test and you get smoke, a destructive failure. What now? You don't have anything to work on. You can't probe a burnt board. You don't even know where to start to look for a fix. Maybe you can build another, back off the input voltage, do some multipulse testing or something, creep up on the point of failure. But it's a really stressful and non-deterministic methodology. It could take days or weeks or months to get to the bottom of this. You don't really know. So is there a better way? Well, we, we think so. We recommend, uh, in this talk, we're going to recommend a different approach. We're going to add a new step. We call it the post-layout simulation step. Uh, we use something we call EM circuit co-simulation to build a virtual prototype. Uh, if there's overstress, it doesn't burn up virtual transistors. You can get a warning of overstress, but the simulation proceeds. Um, and you can, it, because the simulation proceeds, you can pinpoint where the problem is. So there's the first advantage, no smoke. Simulation is non-destructive. The second advantage is speed. You can change something, maybe shorten a trace or widen it or add a ground plane or some stitching vias around a trace. And within, within an hour, just rerun the EM and you'll see the effect. The third advantage is that in simulation, you can probe anywhere. You can use our data display to plot things, even points that are inaccessible to an instrument. You can use a 3D visualization to animate surface currents and see hotspots. The design is a white box, it's not a black box that you need to hack into to access the internals. This gives you the insights you need about where the problem lies and how to fix it. So after this design case exploration, design space exploration, excuse me, you can approach the original pre-layout uh, best case. You iterate uh, on these spins, and you can then, once you've uh, iterated a few times, approach the best case, you can fabricate your design confident that the simulations have predicted the performance correctly and confident you'll get back something that's very, very close to the pre-layout ideal best case. So let's take a look at the tools you'll, you'll need to do this. Now, historically, there have been a myriad of point tools, some are shown here. Each works at a specific spot within the design cycle and it does its individual tasks reasonably well. The problem is that these tools don't really operate beyond the tasks they were built to perform, and they don't really talk to each other. As such, you have to translate data between different tools in order to use them in a flow. Now, translation often produces errors, and this is costly, it's time-consuming, uh, you've got to tra track down the bug and so on. And it also places limitations on what you can analyze. So we began to talk to a lot of power electronics engineers and they told them that the problems they faced uh, were being limited on what they can analyze and having to know the user interfaces of each different tools and having to move data upon multiple tools. And so besides the intrinsic cost of this inefficient process, uh, purchasing and maintaining multiple tool sets to support a design flow is very expensive. For high-speed power converters, we found that more capability and more holistic uh, workflow was needed and so this is what we tackled. The capabilities we uh, refine are shown here. Um, we integrated the schematic and the layout, so you can do pre-layout and post-layout in the same tool. We integrated uh, different circuit simulators, so you can analyze both the pre-layout and the post-layout. We have a, a spice light transient simulator and also a frequency domain harmonic balance simulator that can give you the periodic steady state without um, marching through the start transient. But most importantly, we have an integrated EM engine that can do the extraction and insert the EM-based model of the layout parasitics right into the schematic. So this is the solution we came up with. Uh, we use ADS for EM circuit co-simulation in switch mode power supplies. The layout and the schematic are tied together. There's a field solver that extracts an EM-based model of the layout parasitics. We use something called method of moments. It provides the best balance of speed and accuracy for laminar structures like PCB and packages, multi-layer trace and via type structures. The EM tool produces a compact EM-based model of layout parasitics that you can add to your familiar spice light circuit simulation. The simulation produces a wealth of information 
you can plot the ADIS's powerful data display and 3D viewer. The EM model informs the circuit simulation. On the left, the blue, the layout, trace the layout prosthetics have caused a spike voltage or ringing. We can confirm this subsequently by measurement, the red trace. And this builds confidence in the model library and the simulation is capturing uh, completely all the real physical effects. In addition, the circuit waveforms inform the EM post simulation visualization display. In this case, we can see current crowding, the red spots here, the hot spots. In 3D, using the surface current visualization, locate the hot spots that need attention as we explore the design space. In this case, current crowding is associated with uh, higher inductance because the, the B fields are very close to the traces and a high B field is associated with a high inductance. So this tells us which spots to work on. The red hot spots means we need to put in uh, thicker traces or um, add uh, ground planes or uh, stitching veers or something to reduce the inductance and uh, get rid of that current crowding. So ADS is a, a large platform with many capabilities. So what we've done for you is bundled together in a power electronics bundle, model number W2240, uh, all the capabilities in ADS that are most commonly used by power electronics people. So this will be the schematic capabilities, the layout, the 3D viewer, the uh, circuit simulator, which is spice-like called transient convolution, a linear simulator for AC, DC, and S parameters, the momentum EM field solver that I mentioned that can extract these layout parasitics and insert them into the schematic for a post-layout simulation, uh, our data display, and we have a Verilog A capability for um, custom modeling. And most importantly, a Power Electronics library. We've added a library of components that uh, Power Electronics people use, like uh, pulse width modulators, gate drivers, and so on, that can uh, save you the trouble of having to build up those models yourself. So that's the most common options, and we bundle those all together on the, on the, on the left here. On the right are some options which uh, are less frequently used, so they're available for purchase separately. Uh, one is the FEM simulator, which is an alternate EM field solver. It's very good for 3D uh, structures like uh, motherboard and daughter cards or uh, things like that. And um, it can sometimes have advantages over momentum. Uh, the second option is the harmonic balance simulator, which is a periodic steady state simulator. And it's different from SPICE in the sense that uh, with SPICE, you have to wait for the power up transient to occur before you can see the periodic steady state. With harmonic balance, you can skip that step and cut to the chase and get the periodic steady state directly because it's a frequency domain solver. And the last uh, option is our uh, electrothermal simulator, which uh, is very good for looking at thermal effects, particularly on small um, structures like dye and small packages not so applicable to circuit boards, but um, sometimes useful for thermal analysis. So if you used ADS in the past for RF microwave, you might want to know what is different that we've added for power electronics, and these next three slides uh, show you that. We've added a power electronics personality. As you know, uh, ADS is built for RF microwave, and it has been more recently applied to high-speed digital uh, tasks like signal integrity, power integrity. So now we've added a power electronics personality, which kind of customizes it for power electronics uh, projects. We've added a library of examples uh, for power electronics, so you can get started very quickly. This one example is a uh, current program control buck converter. We have a library of components that are used in power electronics, power device models, the ASM GAN model, ASM's advanced SPICE model for gallium nitride. We have a power mass model that can work for silicon or silicon carbide. And we also have a silicon insulation transistor model. Uh, the next uh, group of components, we call them pre-selection components for conceptual design. This is uh, the stage before you've selected a specific vendor part, even before the pre-layout the pre stage. It's kind of the concept stage. You haven't selected the vendor part, but you want a generic model. So we have generic models for a pulse width modulator a gate driver, a generic MOSFET, and a voltage-controlled ideal transformer that's used in what's called the circuit averaging uh, abstraction. You can use the uh, duty cycle to uh, mimic the uh, 
turns ratio in a, in a closed loop situation. We also have a generic five pin op amp. Um, this complements the three pin op amp in uh, currently in ADS because you have power and ground pins that you can uh, uh, add noise to and find out the uh, uh, column, the noise rejection ratios and so, and so on, as well as setting the slew and the bandwidth. Next, we have a sub-library of uh, analog behavior of logic gates. And you think, well, why logic gates in a uh, switch mode power supply? It turns out that logic gates are often used for digital loop compensators in the feedback loop that closes the loop between the output voltage and the duty cycle. That uh, current controlled example is an example of this. It uses a set, reset, flip flop to control the feedback loop. So we have a library of uh, uh, logic gates. Now, ADS is not a logic simulator. It's not an event-based simulator. So this is analog behavior of logic gates. You can simulate a handful of logic gates in an analog simulator quite nicely. And um, so we have this library here. I won't read off the list. They're compatible with the either LT Spice um, style of logic gates or PSPICE style of logic gates. Uh, if you have uh, a netlist that uses them, we can uh, translate them from PSPICE or LT Spice into uh, the native ADS uh, logic behavior. Then finally, we have nonlinear magnetics. Um, the the ferromagnetic material in uh, large inductors has uh, saturation and hysteresis. So we use the Giles Atherton model to model the saturation and hysteresis of the core. And in addition, we have a, a, a magnetic circuit, which is kind of a, a sister circuit to the electric circuit. In the electric circuit, you have uh, voltage and current as the across and through variables in the differential algebraic equations. There's an exact analog to that in magnetics, but instead of voltage and current, you have magnetomotive force and flux in a magnetic circuit. So we're able to model complex uh, transformers, multi-core transformers, multi-branch transformers using a magnetic circuit built up from these uh, building blocks of a core, a winding, and an air gap. Now, everything I've talked about so far has been the, uh, the right-hand box, uh, which comes from the EDA division of Keysight, uh, ESOF. Um, but there's so much more to this. Keysight, as you know, is an instrument company. And uh, so we have a complete workflow uh, from instruments to model generation to circuit simulation. So let me work here from uh, left to right. On the left-hand side, we have the PD-1000A product, which is a collection of instruments and control software that takes a power device and does many measurements on it, IV measurements, CV measurements, uh, S-parameter measurements. And it produces a set of files, MDM files, that can be used in our Power Electronics Model Generator software or in uh, the underlying ICCAP engine to take all that measurement data and produce the model parameters for an industry standard model like the, the GAN ASM or one of those uh, power MOS models for silicon carbide or an IGBT model. So this is a very exciting flow because uh, from one company you can get the, the measurements, the model generation, and consume the model into a circuit simulation. Currently these uh, connectivities are kind of ad hoc, but um, we're upgrading these to the, the Pathwave user interface standards and uh, data structure standards over the coming months to make this even broader connectivity. So let me summarize this first part of the talk uh, before I move into the second uh, part about case studies, which is the proof of the pudding. Uh, to summarize the first part, we uh, have a pretty complete solution. Uh, we can model switch mode power supplies. We go wherever the power and energy goes. Uh, we can do electrothermal on, on devices. We have uh, sub-circuit simulation with the power electronics um, library with gate drivers, uh, control loops, pulse width modulators. We can import SPICE decks for non-ADS dialects, P-SPICE, LT-SPICE, um, get to circuit models of devices from third-party tools that way. We can model either printed circuit boards or connectors. So for connector simulation, we'd have the uh, FEM method or the finite difference time domain method. We have templates for EMI and EMC masks. Um, you can uh, construct to see if the uh, emissions 
conducted and radiated emissions meet the uh, spectral mask of the regulating body you work with. Most importantly, we can do EM-based models, package and broad level uh, parasitic extraction using our momentum method of moments technology. This uh, enables this post layout simulation, which is so important to eliminate voltage spikes. We can model nonlinear magnetics with the uh, uh, magnetomotive force flux magnetic circuits and a Giles Allerton model of the saturation hysteresis of the core. And finally, we have a, a power device model generation flow uh, for IGBTs, silicon carbides, and uh, gallium nitride using the PD1000A measurement equipment and the IC cap uh, based uh, power uh, electronics model generator tool. So that's a summary of our solution. Let's move on now to some uh, case studies. So case studies, uh, most but not all of these case studies are based on wide band gap devices. That's what uh, really enables this high DIDT era. And uh, so we'll go into those in some depth. Having said that the focus is wide band gap, the first example is actually a silicon device. Um, this was a correlation with measured results for a proof of concept. Uh, the previous methodology, this customer on semiconductor we work with, they agreed to share these uh, data with you. And uh, the customer previously been using lumped element models and attempted to do fitting, but they couldn't get a match to measurement. So with our methodology, we show them how to extract the, uh, the die and the package and the uh, PCB model and had a, a chip package board uh, simulation that predicted the measurement, no fitting required. It was a uh, first principles fit. So a very good correlation there on a silicon device. So that was a high-speed silicon FET. Uh, DIDT is important there. But things are getting even faster. Here's a plot of uh, a figure of merit that is indicative of uh, low switching loss. It's the product of the arm resistance and the gate charge. And it's a very commonly used figure of merit, and that's the y-axis on this plot. The other figure of merit is the uh, the breakdown voltage. And you can see that for silicon, there's a, you could, it's a trade-off between breakdown and voltage and this figure of merit as there are on all of these materials. But it turns out that uh, you can do better than the, the trade-off uh, that, that you can get from silicon alone by using materials like silicon carbide and gallium nitride. You still have this trade-off, but the trade-off is more favorable in that uh, the line is lower and further to the right, which is more desirable. So we're going to move these uh, so-called wide-band gap materials to the next few case studies. So where might you use these uh, new technologies? This is kind of a map of the power electronics industry uh, laid out in two axes. The y-axis is uh, output power in watts. And the x-axis is switching speed. And we've overlaid two concepts on this graph. One is the application space. For example, solar plants, um, top left, going down to mobile um, at the bottom right. Different applications. And overlaid on top of those applications in the black lettering, uh, we have uh, device technologies in the colored squares. And we've, you can see there's an overlap, for example, thyristors uh, overlaps with solar plants. And in solar plants, you're concerned about the, the absolute output power, less concerned about um, size and weight. So you can afford to um, use, use the old style low switching speed devices. And you want uh, devices that have the absolute largest power handling capabilities. So thyristors are a good choice there. But moving uh, down and to the right, where you get applications where um, size, weight, and efficiency are more important than absolute output power. For example, let's take a look at um, auto electronics, for example. There, the, the colored square that overlaps that space where you want you know, a few, few tens of watts, maybe a hundred of watts. Uh, but you're interested in size, weight, and power and efficiency. The semiconductor technology that's most applicable in that case is either silicon carbide or gallium nitride. And you see there's a lot of overlap in the uh, coverage of silicon carbide and gallium nitride in terms of switching speed and output power. 
and uh, so there's overlap in the applications that they can cover also. But generally, the silicon carbide devices are slightly slower and uh, higher uh, power handling capability. The gallium nitride devices are slightly faster on the whole and more limited in uh, uh, power handling. There's still a lot of overlap, and uh, for a lot of applications, which are used a lot and are growing in importance, these two technologies are very, very uh, powerful indeed. And they're really um, enabling this uh, high DIDT uh, era because they have such great uh, switching speed. So our first proof point, our case study in the wide band gap area, this is a joint paper we wrote with Transform, who make gallium nitride transistors. It was published a couple of summers back in IEEE Power Electronics. The reference is shown here. The paper introduces you know, simple concepts that traces are not uh, tachyonic superconductors, as Eric Bogan always says. They have finite impedances. And this has real-world effects. In this uh, diagram on the right here, you've got four ground symbols. And in fact, you can only have one ground. Everything else is a return path because it has finite impedance. If you put a probe on these four so-called grounds and refer it to chassis ground, you'll see that they're not ground at all. They have uh, signals on them. They're not solid DC zero. They have noise because of the traces between these so-called grounds and uh, the chassis ground and the currents are flowing in the uh, finite impedances. A simple point, an important point to make. This series of plots shows the degradation in the so-called uh, drive chain. It starts from the bottom with that purple trace with a nice looking uh, PWM. But as we move up, in the set of graphs, and which is going uh, along the drive train, the signal gets progressively worse. The uh, parasitics are introducing noise. Instead of a nice rectangle wave, we see all these noise components, which can degrade the performance of the device quite considerably. And this is all due to this uh, layout parasitic effect that we've been talking about. So this part of the paper, this was kind of the tour de force of the paper, we were able to uh, predict the outcome of something called a multipulse test. Earlier on in this talk, I showed you a burnt out board, and one of the ways to avoid burning out the board is to not just power it up with a continuous uh, pulse train. Just uh, allow it to have uh, a few pulses and to see what happens and uh, analyze the traces um, and not fully turn on the board. So this is uh, a case uh, where we're doing multipulse testing to try and ramp up a troublesome board. And you can see the issue here on the left, which is the measured data, is that the first few pulses, you see a little bit of ringing at, at, uh, when the gate turns off there. After the third pulse, the ring gets progressively worse and worse. And uh, if you carry on adding pulses to this uh, inductor here, you would experience destructive failure. So the green trace is the measured data. And you see that the ringing gets worse and worse after the third and fourth pulse. The purple trace is the current building up in the inductor. As you add more and more pulses, each progressive pulse uh, adds current, the kind of ramp part of it. Then the, the, the uh, transistor turns off and the current stays more or less steady, degrades it to uh, reduce a little bit. Then you hit it with the next pulse and the next pulse, and the core starts to saturate. So you see the slope of each of the purple traces is getting steeper and steeper each time because the core is going into saturation. So with each pulse, the current in the inductor is increasing uh, more than you might expect if it was a linear inductor. And the ring is getting worse and worse. So what we were able to set up in the simulation is to model this kind of multipulse uh, testing, including the inductor core saturation in the blue trace, which is the simulated data, and the uh, ringing in the uh, voltage pulse, which is the red trace in simulation. So this is very valuable because you can uh, do the multipulse test on a virtual prototype without risk of uh, burning it up before you go into the lab and start doing the multipulse testing on the actual prototype. And often this uh, burn up, uh, people blame it on the GAN devices, but in fact, it's due. the ring is actually due to the, the layout. We can prove that the ring is due to the layout parasitics and the GAN devices are being subjected to a poor layout and uh, they're actually quite robust but they need uh, a well-designed layout to function correctly
This next example, um, our customer SD Microelectronics kindly agreed to share this example. It's where ADS was used to troubleshoot a three-phase uh, power factor control converter. Uh, their first design had significant noise and spiking as well as false turn-on of one of the channels, and that really impacted the performance and reliability. Uh, they tried lab testing, and it proved inconclusive, the measurement limitations, and uh, the schematic only simulation really gave no insight into the issues. So what we did was we imported the layout into ADS and did a post layout uh, uh, simulation. We used our EM circuit co-simulation and we examined the drive chain of the three channels. And this revealed a lot of insights about the false triggering. We could see where the spiking was coming in on the power planes. In fact, the trace between the daughter card here at the front, um, this is the PWM daughter card, was uh, have traces going back to the, uh, the gate drivers. So the spike voltage across the different ground planes was detected in the post layout, and you could be uh, able to help them, and uh, it was addressed in the second design. The second design was very successful, and achieved the power density in the, uh, as you can see in the red box, first pass success of the modified design that we did using uh, virtual prototype layout design in ADS. Now the next um, case study concerns conducted EMI, so let me just set this up for you a little bit. EMI measurements are complicated and expensive. They require a, uh, a chamber and a bench and all uh, sort of equipment like uh, a line impedance stabilization network to separate the electrolytes under test from the mains and EMC and the analyzer. You have to be concerned about industry standard. In this case, it's uh, CISPA 25, which is a uh, um, uh, regulation for um, emissions. They have a spectral mass showing this red line that you have to comply with, and this particular trace is showing non-compliance, especially at high frequency. So we do this kind of uh, measurement in simulation. And the problem is, uh, in simulation, you can use EM uh, modeling, but you can only model a finite piece of the world. You can't model the entire universe, so you have to cut off the simulation at some point. In measurement, you have exactly the opposite problem. You can't exclude the outside world. You can't prevent it creeping in. So it's actually quite uh, complicated to get a correlation between simulation and measurement um, in these kind of measurements. So I'll, we'll show you how this is done in a few slides. So setting aside the problem of modeling the whole chamber, let's just focus here on the bench here. To, to do these uh, measurements, you have to mimic the test bench that's used in a conducted EMI lab. And there are basically five pieces. Uh, on the left, we have the power source, which we call the mains. And then an isolation from the mains, the delison. We try to uh, not inject noise into the mains, and more importantly, not allow noise in the mains creep into our test. So we have this line impedance stabilization network. It's basically a low pass filter and a tap point for the box on the top, which is the EMI receiver. It's a spectrum analyzer. It's basically a superheterodyne radio receiver. And then we have the electrolytes in the test, which is our switch mode power supply, and of course the load. So the listener has several purposes. It, it isolates the power source from the electrolytes in the test and reduces the uh, noise from the mains. It provides a known impedance for the power source and the uh, EUT. It prevents noise generated by the EUT leaking back into the power source. But also importantly, it provides a specified tap point, which is uh, written out in the industry standard, as to how you tap into this um, network and connect your spectrum analyzer and determine how much noise is leaking out into the mains and whether it meets the spectral mask. There's a number of purposes. Another thing you have to take into account when you're doing a correlation between measurement and simulation is the way measurements are done. This is specified in the CISPA standards, and uh, typically the measurements are built around a spectrum analyzer, which is a, a heterodyne receiver. You have a, a filter, an RF filter, RF amplifier, a mixer with a local oscillator, a, uh, an IF filter, and a detector. So the idea is you uh, sweep the local oscillator so that the, uh, uh, a specified frequency is mixed down to the fixed uh, bandpass IF filter, and then you just detect the strength of the signal. 
So to do this, you have to specify a resolution bandwidth. If the uh, EMI spike is within the resolution bandwidth, that's what we call a narrowband signal. If it exceeds the bandwidth, the specified is a broadband signal, and it's kind of uh, done piecewise as you sweep the uh, local oscillator. So in simulation, we don't really have anything like this. We uh, don't have a resolution bandwidth. It's effectively zero. We typically take a, a waveform and Fourier transform it. So in order to compare simulation with measurements, we have to kind of uh, um, take into account how the measurements are done and what the resolution bandwidth was and process the simulation results to mimic the test bench that's used in the standard. Another complication that we have to mimic in simulation is the detection method. Uh, there are typically three detection methods used in spectrum analyzers, average, peak, and quasi-peak. And um, the standard will specify how this uh, detection should be done. So you better mimic this in the simulation. The average value is just a straight averaging. You take the detector response and uh, average it over time. The peak value, you take the detector response and just uh, detect the peak. That's the easiest to compare with the simulation. Um, but more often, they'll specify quasi-peak detector response, where you take the, uh, the raw detector response, uh, put it through a filter, which is fast rise and slow fall, and then do a weighted average of that. So the raw detector response shown in the bottom right is in black, and then the quasi-peak uh, detector response for this fast rise, slow fall is in blue. And the quasi-peak average is in orange, so it can get quite complicated. And um, you don't have any choice. If the standard says it wants quasi-peak, you have to provide that, and so you have to get you have to coerce a simulator to provide something which mimics um, what you get using a quasi-peak detection method on an actual spectrum analyzer. So long story short, this is a lead up to a paper we did with Rome a couple of years ago. It's published on the International Conference on Electronic Packaging. And the problem that Rome were trying to solve is that EMC compliance testing is very expensive. And it's a kind of black box. It gives you no insight on how to correct the issues. You can't really probe inside the electronics and uh, figure out what's going wrong. So their, their goal was to set up a... Uh, a simulation where they could correlate the output of the simulation with measurement and use the simulation as a white box so they could find out where the emissions were coming from. With a simulation, you can probe anywhere you like. There's no uh, restriction of uh, you know, pe peeling back layers or packages or stripping packages down. You can, uh, you can measure the voltage anywhere you want in the simulation. So once they had a very good correlation, you can see uh, here on the, on the top right, uh, good correlation, simulation, and measurement of the ringing, for example. They had confidence that the simulation they built up uh, represented the uh, measurement situation, and they could use that to gain insights as kind of a white box as to where the emissions were coming from, do some what-if analysis to reduce them, and get below the mask. So that was the, the theme of that paper there. So finally, a uh, final example, I want to just touch briefly on thermal. This is a project uh, we worked on with on semiconductor that allows us to share. It's a, uh, a di-level uh, thermal uh, simulation where we compared it with an ANSYS tool like IcePack and got very good correlation. Uh, but this is entirely within ADS, so you can do the EM, the circuit simulation, and the thermal on this particular die all in one in uh, in one tool, one environment. So that was very valuable. And uh, simulation times are quite short, and we get very good accuracy. So uh, even thermal analysis is possible in this case of a uh, small die. Okay, that was the open loop. Finally, I decided to touch briefly on closed loop uh, loop uh, performance. And again, here we can leverage uh, uh, key site strength in instruments. In this case, we took a methodology which was designed for this uh, um, instrument, a network analyzer, and applied it in the simulation. So the idea is to break the feedback loop and insert a, uh, a small uh, non-invasive non impedance. It's a 50 ohm impedance in this case, which is uh, it's intermediate between the output impedance of the uh, converter and the input impedance of the uh, 
the loop. And uh, you can inject uh, a noise into this a loop and determine the stability of the loop in the presence of noise. So this um, a white paper here explains this methodology. And what we did was to take this bench test methodology and translate it into simulation. So you can do the same kind of uh, measurement in a virtual prototype as you could do on a real prototype on the lab bench. So this again shows the strength of having a simulation company as uh, part of a, a measurement company. They have a very measurement uh, oriented mentality. Okay, we covered a lot of ground in a short period of time. Let me just try and uh, wrap up with some conclusions here. Clearly, increasing uh, power density trends are pushing up the switching speed. This is a, a, a big trend in switch mode power supply. And uh, high switching speeds introduce a whole new class of challenges. In particular, the parasitic effects can destroy performance and can be very costly in the design. We believe that EM circuit co-stimulation for post layout gives you the best predictive analysis you can get. And we're offering an integrated workflow that provides more capability and streamlines the workflow for this kind of uh, post layout virtual prototyping. So I hope I've piqued your interest. If I have, then I recommend um, you download our quick start guide. And uh, uh, that will get you up and running with ADS and power electronics uh, pretty quickly. So thank you very much for your attention. And now I think we are moving on to the survey and the Q&A phase. Is that uh, correct? Now it's time for the question and answer session. Colin, here's your first question. This one comes from Eric. Is the compact EM-based model from your field solver the one that you use during the SPICE simulation, or is it a CG ladder or something else? OK, good question. Yeah. the um the model is actually uh, called a bilateral multiple finite impulse response filter. It's made up of multiplies, delays, and adds. It's basically a uh, impulse response. Uh, we use that because it's a much more efficient method than you can achieve with uh, RLCG netlist. The reason why some EM tools use that is because it's a kind of you know, common language. It's not actually the best way of doing it because PCB traces are at their very heart. They're really delay lines. So an impulse response filter, which is made up of delay, delays is the best way to represent its most hard way of doing it. Um, another okay, thanks, are, Colin. The, the vendor who supplies my ferromagnetic core material couldn't supply the Giles Atherton material parameters like the pinning, break energy, and so on. How how can I use your core model? Okay, the model has actually two input modes. It, we call direct and uh, BH driven. For the direct mode, yes, you do need to have the coefficients, and yes, they are hard to obtain. But the BH driven mode only requires you have the BH plot, the hysteresis plot from the vendor. Then what you do is you read off things from the graph, like susceptibility, remnants, coercivity. Uh, our document walks you through this, and you, you plug in those numbers from the BH curve rather than the direct uh, JA coefficients, and that way you can use the model. Uh, from Kivan. I want to extract the layout parasitics using your tool, export a SPICE model, perform the simulation in a third-party simulator such as LT SPICE, uh, where you have specific regulated models available. In principle, you can. Uh, you can export the um, extracted model either in uh, S parameter format or using our broadband SPICE model generator in an RLGC network format, which I stated earlier isn't exactly ideal. But if you do that, you lose the whole point of doing this, which is the integration of the EM and the circuit. Um, the, the circuit ex excitation part of that, where you use the circuit waveforms to excite the EM-based model and visualize the surface currents, you can not only do that in an integrated EM tool. So yes, you can export it, but we don't recommend it. Yeah, I'm back. Let's take this question from Larry. What are the most important aspects that a nonlinear GAN Hamter SIC model needs to capture from high speed switch mode power supply? Are any advances needed in LL, NL modeling for this application? Are there some good examples that include GAN Hemp models that are suitable for this application? Yeah, the, um, 
the first part of the question is very, very complicated. Uh, um, there are whole conferences and journals on device modeling. Uh, there's a whole working party in the in the Compact Model Coalition, the uh, the GAN uh, working group in uh, CMC. That's the industry body that standardizes these models, like the ASM model and the MIT um, virtual source model. So there's a lot of work in this area. I can't, I don't, can't possibly cover it in this short answer. But yes, there's a lot of work there. I point you to the CMC website is the best piece there. Good examples, mm -hmm. yeah, the transform model uh, we built is a, a good example of using the ASM uh, GAN model in a complete uh, switching simulator, that case study I showed you, that was published in the uh, Power Electronics magazine of IEEE, so I'll point to that paper. Great, okay. thanks, Tell and me. we'll be able to, yeah, here's another question for, for from hey. John, and hi, do you have an extensive footprint library in your ADS library, and can ADS import depth 3D models? Okay, yeah, we do have um, a lot of footprints that my vendors um, publish. Usually it's on the vendor website as an ADS library, a PDK, Process Design Kit, or Design Kit, you can get from vendors. Um, the second part of the question is about STEP. ADS, the user interface, is a um, 3D planar user interface. In other words, it's layer by layer, kind of laminar. So ODB++ would be a good import method if you want to drive ADS layout. If you have a full, that's what I call an ECAD interface, like you know, PCBs and packages, I call it ECAD. If you have a full 3D drawing, I call that an MCAD kind of drawing, like uh, you get in SolidWorks or uh, Creo or something like that, uh, then you'd import that into our 3D drawing interface, which is called EM Pro, and that's fully integrated into ADS. You can use multi-technology to import a step file into EM Pro, which is our MCAD interface. Apply one of our field solvers, full 3D field solvers, FEM or find a different time domain, and then import the results and electrically hook them up to uh, the ADS project. So uh, generally, we use Momentum for the uh, 3D planar user interface, the ECAD user, uh, user interface. And then FEM or um, pilot difference time domain in the MCAD user interface is EM Pro. So yes, it's possible, but you need the add-on uh, called EM Pro that gives you the 3D MCAD user. Great. And um, here is our last question. This comes from Andrea. Field solvers usually ask what bandwidth to simulate over, or sometimes even for more detailed inputs like what frequency points to use. How do I translate from my usual time domain characteristics like rise time and switching period? Yeah, in the um, current release of ADS, which is ADS 2019, we have a document that tells you how to set that up. But in the next release, uh, in update one, we've actually automated that, so you don't even have to read the documentation or do the uh, algebra to set that up, and it automatically generates the frequency plan based on some uh, input characteristics of your uh, circuit, like the switching frequency in the device. So it's very simple to do in either the current release or the next release, even simpler than the next release. Great. Thanks so much, Colin. Thanks so much for answering all those questions. I appreciate especially during my quick absence. But uh, this oh, concludes yeah. today's web webinar. And thanks to our um, um, thanks again to you for attending our Keysight Technologies Engineering Education webinar series. We hope you have a great day.